Um, thank you very much for coming. I hope, um, and thank you for the organizers for organizing this school. Um, I, I hope this can be a good session uh, to uh, useful. So I put the video, a, a, pre a recording of a previous video of, of almost the same presentation um, in the Slack. Uh, I was hoping that ideally most people would see that so I can get directly to hands-on uh, and show, actually go to the terminal and run things. Um, so. If if anyone has seen that video, can you raise your hand <laughs> just so I know if uh, if I should re-explain the slides or if I can directly jump to the hands-on? Okay, so two, three, yeah. Uh, okay, so sorry, I'll have to <laughs> give an explanation, uh, but uh, I'll try to be fast. Uh, the recording is there, uh, so um, you can always go go on uh, if if it catches your interest. You can watch the extended video uh, over there. It's in the Slack uh, channel. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, as Susanna said, the main uh, the main uh, point, the main reason that we we worked on this uh, this uh, solution uh, for reproducibility is that most other uh, implementations really uh, are not interested in the terms of long longevity of long term because reproducibility it has it also has a time dimension. You know, uh, so yeah, you want your you want your colleagues today to reproduce your results. You know, um, in in one year during the writing of the paper, but then there's also long term. There's also like yourself in five years. You want to come back and you want to uh, reproduce your results to you know to to apply it to a new data set or um, you found bugs and things that you want to apply. But then one thing is that when you do that, you're going to confront some problems. So um, so manage has been created with the idea of um, minimizing those problems. So uh, before I get into it, I'll just explain uh, where I'm coming from and uh, the, the interesting survey that we're doing. So um, at CEFCA, we have this uh, the JPAS survey that is just about to start. Um, so uh, it's this is the mountains near um, near Teruel, uh, where CEFCA is located. Now, the unique feature of JPAS is that it's in the optical, it's not radio, but in the optical, like when you have LSST or, or Euclid or all these other large surveys, they usually have five or six filters, right? So broadband filters. Now with JPAS, what we're doing is this. We're dividing the optical spectrum into 56 narrowband filters. <laughs> so uh, it's it's really fascinating. You get, you get an almost... Uh, uh, spectrum of every pixel in the sky. And uh, um, yeah, and we're going to cover the northern sky with this JPAS survey. And I'm the pipeline scientist at CEFCA, uh, which is focused on managing all this huge volume of data uh, that, that we're getting every night. Of course, it's not as big as uh, the raw data is not as big as uh, radio, um, but uh, in the radio regime, but the complexity is huge. Um, so we have a lot of uh, things to do on these individual ex uh, filters, individual exposures, to get to the um, to get to the final results, and this actually lets me get into the the actual subject of the of the talk. The you know designing the the workflow, the pipeline of your research. So a, a broad view of your pipeline is like this, right? You have you start with the green boxes, which are your inputs. So you have some pre written software by by other people, and then you have data, which is taken by other people. So you take both of these two from, um, from repositories, from the data repositories, from software repositories, and then you build the software and you run the software on the data and boom, you have your paper, you go celebrating <laughs> uh, and everything is, uh, is good and uh, exciting. Um, but there's a few problems um, that, uh, yeah, where did you, uh, which repository did the data, the software or the data come from? What version were they? Um, when you configured the software, I don't know if you've seen that when you, uh, there's many configuration options and some features can be disabled or enabled or changed during the installation of the software. Um, uh, the dependencies of those software, because there's dependencies of dependencies of dependencies. So there is really a, a crazy tree that goes back. Um, uh, and, and all of these issues occur in all of those uh, situations. Now, when you uh, also for the data, which database does it have a persistent identifier? Uh, what calibration or version were used to make those data? Uh, with the integrity of the data in the middle of the download 
was there a problem or something? Um, and then uh, when you run the software on the data, then you have, uh, how do you deal with confirmation bias? When, when you get a fast result, uh, you know, when you get a good result that fits your hypothesis, you, we usually have the tendency to jump to the next step, right? Um, uh, and then when we go five steps ahead, it's almost impossible to come back, <laughs> you know, uh, because we've gone three steps, five steps ahead and we can't really change, um, change things anymore. So we're stuck with the decision that we made when we were happy. Um, uh, but then later on when we confront that it's a mistake. Um, so so, and then the runtime options, uh, you know, in the papers, they usually say we used like software XYZ and, and, uh, and ABC and CDF. So, uh, but they don't see, they usually don't say the versions of those software. Um, and then how, what order would those software run after each other? Um, you, the environment of your operating system to define the operation of the software. Um, and then uh, keeping this in sync with all of your collaborators. Um, and then once, the, once you get to the writing of the paper, can you keep a history of what you did? Uh, will you cite the software? Because as, as Roberto was saying yesterday, um, software itself is a research product. If you forget to cite software, um, the team that wrote that software will not be acknowledged and will not be able to continue developing it. You should, but then the problem is that you only know your top dependencies. You only know your top level software, but then your top level science software has five levels of dependencies, <laughs> you know, under it. Uh, and then it's usually hard to keep track of uh, all the citations that are necessary for those dependencies of dependencies um, and, and so on. Uh, and is it in sync with the analysis? Like uh, I'm sure you've all experienced that once, um, you know, I was the referee of a paper and then in the abstract, they'd written, we found 52 galaxies that are like this. During the analysis, when you followed it, it was like 54 galaxies. And then in the discussion, they'd written 56, you know, something like that. A different, it was, it was clear that, you know, they, they'd written the introduction and the discussion, they'd come up with a number. And then while they were writing the introduction, probably, uh, or the abstract, probably something changed in their analysis and the number changed to 53, they wrote 53 over there. <laughs> and then in the discussion, it was 56. So uh, how do you keep these in line with, uh, with the analysis? Because papers, you know, a 20 page paper is not easy to manage when you have all these, all these changes. So in the end, yeah, data, so, um, yeah, science is, uh, is tricky. Uh, this, this, uh, this, this figure really shows it nicely. Nicely, it was published in Nature in 2015, 17. Um, and it does a really nice discussion. So it's written by several statisticians that uh, then try to argue that as much as we like to automate data analysis, in the end, it's a human endeavor. And then if you, they read, write it really nicely, if you hunt hard enough, you'll turn up a result. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's gonna be probably a false positive. So then it's the reproducibility crisis paper that uh, that uh, Lourdes also mentioned yesterday. Um, it's it's a big problem. Many of us know it. Okay. So what's the what's the problem with existing solutions um, uh, in terms of longevity? Look, when you uh, when you use Conda, which is the the main uh, the main tool for environment management uh, these days, um, uh, you get, uh, for example, you, when you just install Conda, and this was last year almost. Um, um, uh, you have 39 dependencies. And then when you, for example, Jupiter, when you want to do your, uh, you know, just to set up Jupiter to do your, um, uh, to do your things in a notebook, you'll need 61, 61 extra dependencies. Um, and then, uh, and then Jupiter runs in a web browser. Do you know how many dependencies go into a web browser? Um, and how much the technologies change. Um, uh, so when you're relying on something like Jupiter, you should really be careful about longevity because in, in five years, probably it's not going to run. Probably all the Jupiter's architecture is going to completely change. The browser architectures are going to change and you're going to be left with a file that has huge binary blobs in it that has uh, that is not really readable outside the Jupyter context. Uh, so it's going to be a big problem when you um, uh, 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 now you can spend a lot of time going through those huge binary blobs, finding out the parts of code because it does also keep the plain text source of what you do. But yeah, that, and then you have to translate that manually into a new architecture of like the, the next Jupiter that comes in five years. And uh, so, um, yeah, uh, this, is, this is a problem. And this is, again, the plot that Roberto was showing yesterday. And this is only for Matplotlib, which is, you know, 
let's say a subcomponent of uh, of uh, you know graphic things with, uh, with like like uh, like, uh, like Jupiter. So um, this is a larger version of what uh, what Roberto was showing. So Roberto is the second author in this paper, um, and uh, essentially yeah, there, as, as he said. So at the moment you write write import matplotlib this huge dependency tree of software get loaded. Now imagine if for another software, and I'm sure you've all confronted this issue, for another like your, your data analysis software, this, and I, I don't know what it is, I'm just moving my mouse over, just a randomly selected package. Uh, for example, conflicts with your other software. Matplotlib is not gonna load. Um, and this is going to, um, yeah, then, then you have problems. Now, today it's easy to fix because everything is up to date and version. Uh, you know, everything is up to date with the, with the things and you can contact the developers. But how about in five years? If you contact the developers of this software, um, uh, you know, uh, five years later about problems that it has today, um, it's going to be hard to convince them to spend time to, to help you fix this problem. Um, so, uh, and then our containers, the solution. So containers are, are so that was about, uh, um, you know, Jupiter and the high level um, uh, uh, solutions. And then, the, so there's also containers that, uh, that are commonly mentioned for reproducibility, but they also have some problems. The first one is that, especially if you put your data inside it, they're going to be huge. They're going to be gigabytes of size. So they're super expensive to archive. Um, yeah, today it's fine. Today you say, yeah, my computer is, you know, one terabyte of disk and I can afford like, you know, 10 gigabytes for my container. But, uh, but yeah, in, in five years, you have 20 projects like that. Uh, and then where do you want to copy, keep those? So for example, there's really a nice example because it's really important to remember reproducibility is not something, uh, or these problems, are not something that we confronted today or in the last year or something. People have been talking about reproducibility from the 1990s. It was obvious that this is gonna be a problem. So then in, um, in 2011, Elzevier, uh, <laughs> the devil, <laughs> uh, actually done a, uh, a nice, um, um, uh, let's say challenge, uh, they called executable paper challenge. And then the second place, for this executable paper challenge, it's like what we would call today reproducible, um, was, was this share um, uh, solution. And when you go to the webpage, it's not there, you know, just like what Roberto was saying. Um, it's the, it points to the university of the person that won it. Look, uh, Eindhoven University of Technology. <laughs> uh, then look, it just got information system EIDs. Now, the interesting thing is that last year when I was showing these, um, um uh, the page was active. So, and unfortunately the video was recorded. So, so for example, I can go to the same uh, video that I showed uh, of these slides last year and I'll mute it so uh, I don't double speak over myself. Um, and, uh, and then you, so look when, when I went, so this is the same part. And look, when I clicked on it last year, it showed this, <laughs> you see it? Yeah, yeah, in the, in the thing here. So uh, last, last year was working. Um, so this was the solution. This was the, the best, second best pro, you know, prize uh, of all the people that submitted uh, um, a solution. And it essentially was the same idea as containers today. Um, it was uh, virtual machines. So then uh, it was suggesting that we'll make a web page. So let me see if I make this full screen. Yeah, uh, so is it, is it obvious? Well, you can follow the, the, the link to the paper. The paper is actually still there. Um, and then uh, you'll see. So it's essentially a virtual, it's a library of virtual machines. And um, people that submit papers, they, they wrote a virtual machine like a container. It's, it's more, it's larger than a container, but the concept is the same. Um, so it lasted until 2019. And then um, I think over here, I even clicked on one of the examples. Uh, yes, here we go. Let's see, share is offline. And they've actually said that, uh, yeah, it was taken offline um, uh, because, because there was no more resources to, to keep this huge library of multi gigabyte, um, uh, you know, for public access. Uh, because as you, it's, it's gonna get really expensive. So, um, so yeah, uh, this, is, this is a problem. Uh, the size uh, of, of containers um, is a problem. And also um, they, oh, and the funny thing is that even the, the web page of the challenge by El Xavier is, uh, is offline. So we can actually go there and 
yeah, you'll see that you can actually go and buy this domain. <laughs> now it's, it's available, you can actually go and buy it. Uh, so this is, this is a really big problem that Roberto also touched upon the other day. We shouldn't only think about today and tomorrow. Uh, we should think for more like 10 years ahead. Um, because, because what we do, all this time we spend on one project, like today we're designing JPAS, you're working on SKA, but in 15 years, um, what you're doing, the software you've written is still useful. You shouldn't throw it away. Um, and all the pipelines you've written, uh, all the experience, all the things you had, just don't, don't, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's sad to just throw all that experience away. And, and finally, they're binary. Containers are binary. If you, and binary, it means that you can't open it in a text editor. <laughs> you can't print it. You can't, um, you need your kernel, your operating system kernel needs to match with the kernel of the container. Um, if it doesn't match, you're just going to have a 10 gigabyte uh, blob, <laughs> you know, uh, and then, uh, yeah, good luck trying to find a kernel that can open it in 10 years. Um, and uh, now there are simulators for CPUs that can try to simulate the CPUs of like 10 years ago. Um, but yeah, it's going to take a lot of your time trying to just set it up to be able to just load the kernel. Um, yeah, because yeah, the long term release of, uh, of operating systems uh, and the kernel is in, is in a time frame of 10 years. So, but our careers as scientists goes over 10 years. We worked for like 30 years until, or 40 years, and some of us don't even retire. We still come to the Institute and we still work. Um, and uh, yeah, only on common architectures. So there's one nice example of this, um, this paper in uh, computing and science and engineering that, uh, that yeah, reproducible workflow on a public cloud in computational fluid dynamics. And they were advertising containers a lot. But uh, in the container, in the recipe that the in the the container, the, the Docker file, um, they actually had from Ubuntu 16, and the paper was published in 2020, and they had from Ubuntu 16.4. Now, if you go to Docker today and download and run from Ubuntu 16.4, look at the versions, and this is uh, so uh, the versions are from 2021. They're not the same um, operating system that those guys were wrote their paper with. Even though the version of the Ubuntu is the same, the, the internal things are different. Um, and uh, this is gonna be problems. This is the reason you get different results every time you run it on, uh, on, a, different, uh, on a different system. Okay, um, so, so because of all of these, because you know, we didn't just create manage out of nothing. We, we tried all of these. I spent a lot of time trying to find the best one of these solutions. And ultimately the, this is the paper that we describe managing. So um, this is like, yeah, the main paper is how many pages it's, uh, is nine pages. Um, but uh, from, from page nine uh, and, uh, up to page 27, <laughs> it's, it's all an appendix, uh, reviewing the, the, all the existing tools um, and, and the various problems that they have with longevity. So uh, we go one by one the, the, from virtual machines to containers to, uh, to Conda, uh, citing, everything is cited with examples. So it's a paper. Um, and then to archiving, um, job management, you see all of these are actually re fully reviewed over there. I'm not saying these out of you know, some personal, I tried every single one of these solutions. Um, and, uh, and then even so, and then, but the interesting part that I really recommend you to have a look at is, uh, is Appendix B. Appendix B, I went into, uh, into a deep historical analysis of all of these um, um, reproducibility solutions that had come from the 90s. Um, again, this is not something that came up today. Um, and you see, like, there's, there's this actually one of the first ones was this, what they now call red, uh, reproducible. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a long time. And uh, they actually used GNU Mate, which in manage will still do. So uh, that, that was good. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, yeah, but then you, you look at the web page, you see the history. Uh, in the end, the team was able to do this up to about the year 2000, and then it stopped. And then, yeah, the main uh, uh, um, uh, it, it stopped. Uh, they tried to change it to Python, um, but then Python was still not evolved enough in those in the early 2000s. So then they hit problems, and then they stopped. They published a few other papers on the on the solution, but then they stopped. Then there was one that became really popular, Taverna, 
uh, that was released in 2013, and uh, um, it was it was really popular. I think it's uh, it's repository before it went, uh, you know, and it was actually supported by Apache. So um, it was it was um, it was I think it had 10,000 users, but then in the end, um, because the technologies changed, um, it went off. And as Roberto was saying, um, more than 10,000 workflows just suddenly disappeared. Um, and, and again, if you there that, you know, 30 years ago, people also done this. And today we can look back at what happened to their solutions that used the fancy, uh, you know, uh, technology of the day um, that was deprecated uh, only like you know five years later? So this is this is really important. It's good to it's good to see this when you're deciding to um, uh, to to design your workflow. Okay, so enough with the problems, the solution. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, uh, because of all these problems, yeah, we thought we'll just go back to the foundations. We'll go back to the tools that are already available and the tools that will not change, uh, that have not changed in the last 30 years. And, and because the whole modern operating system architecture depends on them, they're not going to change in the next 50 years or something, at least. Uh, well, we can't say the future, but at least we can say in the foreseeable future that existing operating systems are alive. Um, these tools are not going to change. So we went really to the core foundations um, and we called it manage. So managing data lineage. Um, data lineage is the term um, uh, mostly the business uses for, for um, uh, uh, essentially reproducibility and provenance. Um, so, um, and yeah, we published a paper in, uh, in CSIE, um, the Computing and Science and Engineering. And uh, in 2019, um, we actually got a grant from RDA, from Research Data Alliance, because it, it satisfied all of their recommendations on open software. Um, and um, yeah, my first visit to Granada was thanks to this grant. <laughs> um, and uh, and we had some really nice discussions back then, just before COVID. I mean, it was one month before COVID, less than a month before COVID hit, and we were locked up. Um, so, and then later when the paper came out, um, uh, Nature Astronomy done a nice, uh, well, not not too kind, but but the review. So it was it's like a referee report. Um, I re I recommend you to read it. It's it's title is nice, no expiration date, um, and uh, it comes up with a nice conclusion. So you can actually come here and they gave the free to read list and uh, you can yeah you don't need uh, uh, a subscription to nature astronomy to read it uh, but you just have to activate javascript um, okay so in the end they make the, the author makes a really nice uh, which which i agree with uh, a really nice uh, um, you know argument that uh, yeah, convincing someone to use manage um, is like uh, convincing someone familiar with Microsoft Word to use LaTeX. Uh, it's uh, once they understand the beauty of LaTeX, they'll love it, but uh, it's going to be hard to, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's not hard. I mean, at least for me, I loved LaTeX when I first learned about it, but um, yeah, some people find it hard to get accustomed because you really go low level. The idea is that to have longevity, you should take some responsibility on yourself. Um, you, you know, just being happy with pressing enter is not going to give you longevity. Um, and uh, okay, then uh, okay. So let me just uh, go uh, into the the core concept to just clarify some definitions here. So uh, there's this when we say reproducibility, some people think that we're talking about data collection, but we're not. So there's this definition by the National Academies of, uh, of Sciences that this Zoom thing doesn't come up for you. That's good. Um, OK, so according to this uh, definition in the National Academies of the US, um, they, they tried to clarify because people were using these terms uh, you know, interchangeably and they were confusing with each other. So we, let's define it like this. When we say, when we're talking about data collection, we're talking about replicability. Replicability is, um, uh, let's take it like that. So that means when you go to the telescope and look, this was this was the actual guy, uh, you know, who was in the telescope observing in those days. <laughs> um, and uh, so this is when, um, yeah, this is uh, when you collect data. Um, uh, and then when you say reproducibility, reproducibility means when you have the data, and you even have the same software, the same versions, and you expect the same result naturally, right? Um, uh, yeah, like two plus two is four. 
two is one data and the other two is another data set and the plus is the software, you expect this to be the same all the time. Um, but yeah, as we discussed, that's not the case. So uh, usually, so, so reproducibility is the moment that your data becomes a file. It's not about data collection. It's about data analysis. Um, so um, then the principles, I'll skip over these because, uh, well, they are important, but we don't have much time. Um, uh, so the sun is in the clock. I, I can't see the, the hour, but uh, okay. So for now, we'll, I'll try to get on the hands-on uh, demonstration soon. But in practice, you'll see that everything in manage is plain text. Everything is just a plain text file that you can open with your favorite text editor. Um, um, and uh, like in this file, we have the versions of all the software that, for example, you need in your project. And it automatically installs all the software from scratch. And the installation, the, the instructions to install the software, it doesn't use Conda or, or Homebrew or I don't know, all these other package managers that, uh, that are available because something like Conda itself is written in Python. Imagine, so you have a bootstrapping problem. If you, if your software, if you, if your workflow is written in Python, then where do you get the Python that the workflow needs to run in? Um, and uh, so over here, essentially, we're doing the whole building of the software infrastructure from scratch. And when I say the whole software infrastructure, I mean down to the C compiler. We even build our own C compiler. We don't use your operating systems. Well, initially we use your operating system C compiler to build the C compiler. <laughs> uh, but then after that, uh, everything, uh, you know, is built. The high level software are built with the custom C compiler that its version is the same and uh, uh, between all the different users that come. And this includes everything. So look, we even installed the core utils, the new core utils like LS, CP, MKDIR. Have you noticed MKDIR, its versions are different. It operates differently on different computers. Um, or all Corsetto, even later, we, we build uh, for you independent of your operating system. And there's no need for root. So when you go to a large computer, you don't have to spend um, a lot of time with the administration of the, the HPC. Um, everything is built uh, in, in one build directory that you, um, you just, um, you don't need any root permission. And uh, yeah, each project can have its a separate build directory. So nothing is gonna conflict. And best of all, it's all plain text, no binary. Um, and in the end, because we build the software ourselves and because we're scientists, we also give you the citations of the dependencies of the dependencies, you know? Uh, so when you use, for example, um, uh, you know, source extractor for detection and then source extractor depends on FFTW, the, the fast Fourier transform library, but then FFTW has a paper that you should also cite you usually cite, the, for example, when you use Extractor, but do you cite the FFTW authors? They spent a lot of time. Uh, they spent a lot of energy. You should cite them. Um, uh, yeah, and so this does it automatically. The citations for all the software come into your LaTeX as a LaTeX macro. Um, which is just, you know, it's just one line of later underneath. It's just a macro that defines all of the, the dependencies that you just build in. And then for the data, um, we keep the full URL of the input data and the MD5 checksum. So if the data on the server has changed, you know, um, and it, sometimes it happens, the server changes some calibration, the URL is the same, but the data is different. Um, uh, and then you're gonna get a different result. That, that's not a problem with your software environment. That's a problem with the, 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 the place you got the data from. So we keep the MD5 checksum. And now, in fact, it's become, uh, we've updated this to uh, SHA, I think, uh, uh, 256. Uh, um, so it's much more secure. <laughs> and so essentially, even if one pixel changes in your input image or your catalog, um, the, the, the pipeline is going to stop. It's going to stop and say, be careful what the, the previous run of the pipeline was run with this. The data had this hash, but now that you're downloading it has a different hash. So then you know at least what's the difference and you can contact the data providers and say, what happened? Why is it different? Um, uh, okay, then for running, as I said, we use GNU make. Um, so essentially it's make, make is this beautiful. So look, 
Make was written in the 1970s, right? Um, very, very long ago. Um, uh, and, uh, and it hasn't changed. It's such a robust software solution that it hasn't changed. And it's been used in all software uh, when you build, essentially. Almost all, uh, I would say like 99.9% .9 of, of the software you're using uses Make. The Linux kernel uses Make. The GNU C compiler that the Linux kernel is built with uses Make. Make is not going to change. Because yeah, if make changes, uh, we have a new operating system, <laughs> right? So as long as we have GNU Linux, we have make. Um, it's not going to change. It's plain text, and it does its its job is so beautiful. It's so elegant. It just uh, you essentially you define a prerequisite over here in this green part that I'm showing here. Like this is a prerequisite. You see, it's just a .conf file, and this is just a summary for a .fits file. You see, you just say okay, this fits file. Like th this is the target up here. Um, so this, for example, this noise chisel I've written here is the target. This is the prerequisite. This is the dependent. So you say like my noise chisel output uh, depends on these input files. So a few fit files and a config file. And then this is the recipe that you want to build your target from the prerequisites. And then the, the target here becomes the prerequisite of the next rule. So essentially it builds a chain. It builds a beautiful chain of dependencies um, that, uh, and, and you can parallelize it. Um, uh, it's, it's just so, it's so, it's so wonderful. And it has a really good manual. So um, just to encourage you to have a look um, uh, because yeah, because it's 40 years it's being developed or GNU make it's like 30 years from the nineties. Um, uh, it has a really good manual. You can actually uh, come and read it. And it's written yeah, by, by the founder of GNU. Look, uh, Richard Stallman has actually is the author of this. Um, and uh, it has really nice examples. You can, um, you can learn it nicely and you can implement it as, as easy as you like. So uh, now we'll, we'll go through an example, hopefully, if I can catch the time. Um, um, and so then finally, after the analysis is done, um, uh, all, the, um, uh, all the analysis outputs, we don't write them in the paper by hand. Like, look over here, this is, a, uh, um, this is a, the, a screenshot of a PDF paper. Look, there's three numbers here, 1.89, 1, 1. 2.37, and 4.77. We didn't write these numbers by hand. These numbers were actually latex macros. And where did these latex macros come from? A single file with all the numbers that we write in the paper. So this, may, this actually connects the analysis to the text of the paper. So then this file, here are the three numbers. And the analysis essentially wrote these, uh, like with this single line, you see it's in a shell loop. With this single line, we automatically wrote those three numbers. So anytime those three numbers change uh, because of the analysis, anything in the analysis, the data changed, the my configurations changed, the version of the software changed, I don't have to worry. I just, when I rerun my pipeline, make does all the beautiful, it does its job, its job beautifully to organize the dependencies, find what changed, rerun that step. And as soon as it reruns that step, it's gonna recreate this file. And my later is going to put these numbers in beautifully over there. And I can peacefully focus on my science, <laughs> you know? Uh, I don't have to go, yeah, like those, those papers, the, those authors that was referring, right? different versions of the same number in different parts of the, of the paper. Um, uh, okay, so as one example, I'm showing um, this, uh, this is what we actually put in the managed paper. Uh, because it was general, we wanted to not be specific to astronomy, so we used a paper that actually uh, studied software citation with some machine learning natural language processing tool to see how software citation has changed over the years. So they put the data in a data repository, and so um, we got the data and I'll show you here how manage worked. So in the end, the goal, because in make, as we showed you, the dependence, it's, it, the job is to organize prerequisites, right? So uh, when you're thinking in a prerequisite paradigm, not, uh, you know, normal top-down paradigm, you think from down up, you think from the end to the start. So what's the goal of your project? paper.pdf, right? <laughs> you want, we all want to have paper PDF. Uh, where does paper PDF come from? So over here, the color coding is the green uh, things are, are files you've written by hand. Um, and the purple ones are files that you've, that have been created automatically. Um, so later on, you'll see that this goes to version control and it actually uh, allows the managed work. So paper.tech for all those numbers that we showed in the, in, that you use in your, in, within your text, 
for all those numbers, it depends on project.tech. Project.tech is that list of macros, latex macros with numbers. So, and then where does project.tech come from? Project.tech depends on verify.tech. So verify.tech actually has, keeps the checksum of all of these numbers. So especially after you publish, um, uh, it, if, if any single number, even in your paper, not just the inputs, after all the analysis is done, in the paper, if a single number changes, the hash is gonna change and verify.sh is gonna stop your pipeline and it's gonna tell you um, if you activate it. During development, you don't activate it because it's annoying. Uh, but then when you publish, um, you want people to get exactly what you got, right? And the only way to do that is to use the checksum of this file to actually make sure that um, not a single digit of a single number um, uh, changed. So then, okay, where does verify all of those things come from? Okay, so one of them is initialize.tech. This just gives the basic um, things. So essentially look that the chain that we define and make, the prerequisites chain, is primarily just the tech files. So then look, for example, that demo plot, we have a demo plot.mk. In the end, it makes a demo plot.tech. Right, so this demo plot.tech getting is verified, then gets put in project.tech, then goes into the paper. Now, where does this demo plot come from? It comes from like tools per year.txt. This is the table that built the, the plot that, that we showed. Where does this come from? So then we have a previous a, a, another make file called format.mk that uh, has this table three.txt. This is the raw table that comes from the, the authors of that previous data set. And then where does table.3 come from? It comes from, uh, we called it Menke 20. The author was, uh, the, the name was Menke. It was in the year 20, um, 2020. So it was an Excel file. So they had actually published an Excel file. And um, so then with a the script, we, we convert, we pull out this sheet of the Excel file into a table.tech. We convert it into the numbers that we want to show. And then it goes down here. So then where does Menke.20 come from? It comes from a file called inputs.conf. Right, so inputs.conf is that same one I showed you before, and this is green. This is green. So this is this is a file you've written by hand, and it actually contains the URL, the checksum. So yeah, if these authors change the file, um, the pipeline, if you run the managed paper, it's going to stop and it's going to tell you be careful. The the input changed. Okay, then it also, for example, we want to report the URL in the paper. Right, so download.mk also has a download.tech that comes into the paper. Then format.mk, for example, we want to report the number of rows uh, in the input table within the text. We want to say like they studied, I don't know, 500,000 papers. We get that number from uh, format.tech. It gets written in format.tech, which then comes into the paper. And then, for example, in the paper we cite one year, we say, okay, in this year, they, they, they recorded this many observations. So uh, which year was it? Like that year is in a configuration file. So if you change, for example, we showed, I think 1996. Um, if you change that year to, I don't know, 2003, make is gonna recognize that this changed. So because this changed, it's not gonna recreate tools per year.tech. It's only going to come and recreate demo plot.tech because this demo year.conf and two tools per year.tech were a prerequisite of demo plot.tech. So it's only going to rerun this step and it's going to give you the number and it's going to stamp it into the PDF um, that you get in the end. And then you can easily extend this. Now, Sepida is going to show a really complex scenario for her PhD thesis that uh, she implemented fully uh, in Manage. Um, and it can be as complex as you like. I mean, there's no, and, and the great thing is that because of make and all of these separate make files, it's really modular. So you can essentially pick up one make file from one project, put it in another project, just change some things. If you follow a good naming convention and file structure. So this actually brings me to the file structure. So remember those green files we showed before? When you download manage, now hopefully I'll get to show some uh, basics of it. Um, um, when you download manage, you have these, these are the files you already saw, right? You have paper.tech in the top project file, and then uh, in and then you have a reproduce and a tech directory. So you see the the, the, the subdirectory reproduce and a subdirectory tech. And then inside reproduce, you have two components, software and analysis. So in software, for example, we have all those versions.conf that we that had all the um, versions of all the software you use. And then we have like the building of those software with, with high level.conf. And then we also have uh, in the analysis subdirectory, you have your actual analysis. So 
and they're all written in the same language. So once you learn manage, if you're not happy with the way we built one of the software, go ahead. It's in a Git branch now, I'll show the Git. But then yeah, go and change the instructions to build the software. If you see we didn't include the software you need, the instructions are the same as the analysis. It's not like, you know, um, let's say in Conda, which is a whole separate language. If you want to change the way Conda builds the software, you have to spend a lot of time learning how Conda works. But in this case, no, it's the same build infrastructure that you do in your analysis, we build the software with, it's all make. And it follows exactly the same logic. Um, so then this is like a larger vision of the all the files. Hopefully I'll show this later. Ooh, okay, um, before going into the manual, uh, the, the hands-on thing, I'll just show this thing that all of these questions, as you saw, were answered in plain text. And as a result, a plain text. So because it's plain text, yeah, we have Git. And with Git, look what happens. So uh, hopefully many people are familiar with Git, but just for those that aren't. So you've answered all of these questions today, right? Today I was working on my project. I, I done part of my project, my analysis. I downloaded my input data. I put them in, okay. So then when I commit my project and I go, okay, tomorrow I come back and I continue, but then I've committed uh, all my changes. So these actually become two points with a, with a clear signature. Um, of the changes that you did as you evolve, right? So then what happens is that manage itself is a Git branch, right? So you have this Git branch, which is manage, and we're developing all the users of manage are also, you know, sending bugs, like someone finds a bug on Mac, another person finds a bug on a Linux from 20 years ago, <laughs> you know, uh, the different uh, things, different situations. So essentially we have this core manage branch, and then Every project is just a, a branch from the main manage branch. So then, for example, when you want to start your project on Galaxy Evolution, for example, you come here, you start your project as a separate commit, and you continue doing commits as you go on. Now, in the background, so it takes you six months to, for example, to do your research. In the background, manage has also evolved. Now, thanks to you and other people, we found bugs, we've improved the low-level infrastructure, and you were working on your paper. Now, for example, when your paper is almost ready to publish, you just merge all of those underlying things that you never even knew happened on a computer you never confronted with are automatically brought into your pipeline. And as a result, your project also becomes portable to all of the bugs that thanks to other people who are able to find and fix. Um, and then you just continue and then we continue. And the moment you publish, this is the, the nice part. You see each commit has this hash, the, uh, the, the hash of the commit. Manage actually gives you a latex macro for this hash that you print into your PDF. So, uh, you know, you just need to give uh, the, essentially the, the URL of the, 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 the Git repository where you kept the data and thanks to software heritage, you don't even need to do that. There is software heritage. Um, you can just give that, uh, that hash and, and everyone will know exactly which point in the history of your project you built the final version of your paper. And uh, yeah, then it's really a, a true stamp of verification. And we actually do that. Look, in my papers, I put this hash at the end of my abstract, not even the main body of the text because yeah, the, the predatory journals don't release uh, the PDF sometimes. And I, I want other people to be able to release, to see it. So I put this hash in the end of my abstract. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, so yeah. And if, for example, like this is the, the main uh, manage paper. Um, uh, I think it's this one. Uh, it goes into this other monitor. Um, so when you go into the manage paper, uh, you see we have the hash over here of the of the commit in the abstract. And in fact, uh, we also have the the software heritage ID that Roberto was showing the other day. Look down here. This is the software heritage ID. So uh, we we also give the URL like the Git uh, the Git repository that the manage the the project is in. But then there's also the software heritage ID, and you click on it, and uh, it takes you directly to software heritage. So if manage.org breaks down, I don't know, in ten years, um, uh, yeah, you always still have it in software heritage. Um, and the same goes for GitHub, GitLab, um, as Roberto was saying. 
you know, companies get bought and sold and, and uh, you know, die very fast, uh, unbelievably fast um, uh, when, when the time comes up for them. And then like, you know, this, this figure here, and then now this is where, uh, we, you know, you can also see other examples, like this plot that I showed here that we reproduced. At the end of my abstract, I've put a link to the Zenodo because software heritage is for software. Zenodo is for data. So then in Zenodo, I said, look, the underlying data of the left plot are available in Zenodo. You click on this and okay, we open it with Emacs. And look, this came from Zenodo. It wasn't on my computer. Um, and then, so the moment manage again, allows you to even create uh, help simplifies. You can make these any way you like, but manage has internal um, scripts that seem really simplify doing this for your um, uh, project. So let me make it large. Look like over here, we actually actually have some metadata, data of plot showing fraction of papers that mention software. And like the original data was this. And then over here, we describe the columns. And look over here, we actually give the DOI of the journal, the DOI of Zenodo, the archive link, the Git repository that was underlying all of the analysis. And this is all here. Imagine if, if all papers were, um, um, yeah, please write your papers like this uh, for your readers. Um, be kind to the readers. Um, uh, yeah, you can. You can do all of these things and with manage, you can do these things with any tool. It's not, this is, as you saw, manage does not define a new tool. Manage is just a different usage. Well, not even different. It's it's the standard usage of standard tools. <laughs> Let's say. It doesn't define a new language. It doesn't define a new workflow system. Make has been here for 40 years and it's going to stay. Um, so um, yeah. So then, yeah, you can put the, as I showed you with software heritage on, on R. Oh, another nice thing. And actually this is the history of how it was created. Because it's all plain text, the whole source of a super complex project in one snapshot of the Git is gonna be like 100 kilobytes. You know, it's just plain text. It's not, it's not a data. You don't actually have the links to the data. So what happens is that in manage, we have this thing, project make dist, and then it actually packages the whole project for archive. You know, it builds a, a, a tar.gz file that you can just upload to archive and it does all the, it prepares everything for you. And in that, so look over here, I went to the archive of the paper um, and then I went to other formats. I didn't go into the PDF. I went into other formats. And then when I go to other formats, I um, there's a source. Look, you can go download source. You go to download source, you go save file. And like, for example, I install, I, I put it in the software directory here. And when I open my, my browser, I go to my software and this is here. Now, the strange thing is that archive removes the tar.gz for some reason. Uh, so you have to manually write tar.gz. Uh, and then when you open it, look, at the top directory is what archive accepts. And this is why the tech part is at the top. So paper.tech is in the top directory. And then there's the reproduce. This is this came from archive, not even you know a software heritage or anywhere else. And this is just a snapshot. Unlike software heritage, it doesn't keep the history. This is just a snapshot that created that I created the paper with. And I come here. So even if for some reason software heritage goes by, but uh, but archive stays, then this tarball is going to be in archive. And um, so we try to redundant, you know, what do they say? Redundant, uh, uh, they create redundant copies because it's so cheap because it's all 100 kilobytes. Archive doesn't notice this because even one figure in my paper is larger than my whole reproducible pipeline that I spent five years writing. Um, and uh, yeah, over here you have, for example, in the software, you want to see what versions I use. You, as I said, even, uh, so you just come to the config and you come to the versions.conf and here you are. These are the versions of, of everything from, uh, from the version of make to the version of wget to, I don't know, the version of uh, cfits.io that I used for, you know, running fitsfat. It's all here. And the instructions, even the checksums, look, the, the checksums of the tarballs of the software are actually here. So they're not, if, if they change, uh, manage is going to complain. And in fact, for this, we have um, uh, Zenodo on zenodo.org. Uh, so sorry. We have, um, uh, if we search manage, we have a repository because we noticed after some time that, uh, again, we were downloading tarballs from the or sources of the, uh, the, the software, the authors of the software themselves. Um, but then they would change. 
they will change. Um, you know, some some software changed their name after a few years. Some software uh, stopped uh, uploading. Some software went. You know, they stopped. So the 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 solution we came up with was that we make a Zenodo repository, um, which is essentially the tarballs of all the software that were used in Manage. You know, and the, when you download and run Manage, it actually the first place it looks for software is this Zenodo repository, not the original URL of the of the software. Um, and since they're all free software, we're allowed to do that. We can't use software heritage here because software heritage keeps the source of the software. And in many cases, uh, you can't, the source alone is not enough. You need to bootstrap the software. You need to add some extra things. And then doing that itself just adds another complexity. So we kept the, the tarball of the snapshot of the version. Again, software heritage is good for the history and the source, the plain text. Over here, you can't see the line by line, the beautiful features Roberto was showing the other day. You can't see that here. You just see a tarball. But, um, uh, but here, this is ready to build, but on software heritage, it's not ready to build necessarily. Um, so yeah, so we have this here, and this is where the software comes from, and it gets built. I was hoping to have a 20-minute talk, but it took 45 minutes <laughs> so far. Uh, and this is how you work. So with Manage, you just clone the repository, you run Project Configure and Project Make. Now, I'll, hopefully, I'll get to show you this in a second. I'll skip this, and I'll put it on the summary. So I'll take questions. Also, give maybe a five-minute rest in case everyone wants to go have a drink or, I don't know, have water or something. And then, uh, yeah, we can, we'll continue. So is there any questions? Um, Well, the, the session is still a, a, until 11, I think. Yes, 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 it's up so, to 11. But is, there is, remotely, is, is Fide? So, uh, so later, she's going to talk later after this. After after, after the hands-on demo. Before the coffee break, right? Just before the coffee break, yes. So now, if there's any questions about the slides, um, just to avoid me talking continuously, please ask a few questions so I can also rest a little. <laughs> then uh, we can go. I have a, a question. I think in one of your slides, when you show the um, uh, all the these make files, the the structure of uh, the here, no. Uh, so I think this, this, is, the this is the next structure. one. No, no, no. The, when you show the the make file, this schema with the make. Yes. Uh, here. Next one. No, the next one. I think. Uh, the or the graph. The graph ah, with the, the green boxes yes, and yes, the names yes. of. I think that here is like um, you need to understand this better in order to to know how to use manage. I, so I think yes, this yes. is the core. Of it. So I would like to uh, spend some minutes here. Be, people can understand better because here I I understand that uh, you are trying to uh, uh, verify with the checksum the input data. But to be honest, I cannot see where is the software here. I can where, where is in which make file are you compiling and building the software? Yes, yes. So the software are the flashes. Uh, so every flash is one run of the software. Now, what software? I thought I'll remove that because it just adds complexity to the plot and makes it hard to read. But essentially, like this, this flash is is for example, uh, you know, a script that reads uh, this table dot uh, table dot tech. And because the, the, the version that they released, um, like the version that they released, it was the raw format for every, like they studied 500,000 papers and it was actually 500,000 lines. So um, uh, this table dot three is actually 500,000 lines. Then in, in tools per year, we there was a column for the year of the paper. So then we just aggregated all of the papers in one year. So this all went into one script from this one to this one that the software to produce, because in make the target is the, uh, and the target and prerequisites are all files. So uh, the software goes into the recipe. Uh, and so over here, I just kept it on the file level. So the, the connection between files are recipes in make that are actually shell scripts or, or Python scripts. In make, the, the recipe can be Python. It doesn't have to be. Uh, so, so for make, and let me go to the, the chat room. Uh, we, we organized this talk um, 
uh, where was it, the, the main, uh, here. Um, so I, I really recommend, it's, it's great, it's a good, it, once you learn it, you'll love it. Um, it's so simple and it's so powerful. Um, so there's this nice video that Sepide and uh, a friend of hers, which is a PhD student in IAC. Uh, so they, they organized this video, it was a recording in IAC, and they actually together show how make works. So yeah, this was the, the team. So we organized um, over here. Yeah, they go they go into the nice details of how to write a make file look. It's actually very hands-on. Um, so I recommend to watch this. You'll enjoy it, even if you decide later not to use it. Just knowing make it's um, it's uh, it's really good. So they start from the scratch, from from nothing. You don't need to know anything about make, and they actually write every line line by line. They don't copy paste. So they actually give you time to think about uh, what they're writing, and um, uh, and they explain everything. Um, so yeah, over here, like I said, they're showing the the parallelization look, which is running it here. Maybe just uh, I'll increase the. It is the voice. It doesn't come. You have to, uh, you have like to share the, the sound. Uh, the sound is active. You are screen share. Because you are sharing screen share. Yes. In Zoom. You need to share also the other. In Zoom. I have that's active. Uh, I'm sharing audio. Uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah, the video is here, and uh, so look for example when I oh look like this is the part she ran it in on a single thread. You see, it's just like all of the eight CPUs on her computer on a single thread, and now she's gonna run it uh, in Make. It's the same command. You just say minus J for jobs, and then like the number of jobs you want. And uh, now she's going to run it in make. So she's writing down here at the bottom of her terminal, um, uh, the Emacs window, actually. Uh, and look, she's going to write minus J8. Now look what happens. As soon as she presses enter, it's beautiful. It just parallelizes things so magic. It's, it's great. It's great. Look, look, all CPUs went 100%, <laughs> right? Uh, you actually feel you're, you're using the, the money you paid for that expensive CPU. You know? <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's really, uh, make is just more. Can you share the video with us? Through Slack? It's in the Slack. Yes. Ah, it's already. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. And you see, like, yeah. it's, in, it's in the first make that you uh, compile all this and the, the environment, no? Because you mentioned that you compile from the very beginning, even the core, uh, yes, core yes. tools like yes, yes. RCP. So it's in this first. Oh, no. Thing. In this, uh, so here we just do the analysis. So if I go, uh, here, so you'll see in a moment. Um, uh, this this plot I was showing uh, is only for the analysis component. Uh, the software component is again make files, but it's a different. Uh, uh, you know, the, the dependencies actually depend on the software versions and the dependencies of the software. Um, it's the same kind of graph, but but for software, the versions of software. Like Astro Pi depends on Python, Python depends on this other package, this other package depends on this other package, and then that depends on the C compiler. And, um... Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, I, I arrived late, so maybe you have already explained, but can you briefly explain what the verify verifies? <laughs> Mm. Uh, yes. What does uh, it <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the every number or every data that goes into a plot, every number that goes into a text of your paper, or every data point that goes into the plot of your paper. We actually keep the checksum. So look, for example, let's, let's show it in practice. Um, uh, the, the, the manage paper, uh, we just go here, okay. We clone, we copy this command, and um, we open a terminal, and let's go into the, is it clear? Is the font size good? Uh, Okay, uh, so then let's go to TMP software and then git, well, I copied the command. Um, so git clone, yes. So now look, it's cloning the managed paper and it's finishing, okay. So now if I go to this manage uh, paper uh, here, you see I'm on the master branch. And then uh, if I do LS, you see the top two directories. Oh, in the case of manage, I even put the comments of the referees <laughs> in, in the Git repository. So you can actually see what the referees, we got five referees for one paper. Uh, so yeah, you can actually come and see what the referees said and how we implemented the answers that we gave to the referees. We even put that here, look, uh, uh, you know, review one and then answer one, review two, it's all there. Uh, it's good to also release the, the, re the, the referee report. Um, okay, so let's just go back to avoid sidetracking. So to answer your question, 
Uh, we go to the managed paper, and then in the managed paper, we want to the verify that tech. So we go to, um, uh, uh, we can just open Emacs, uh, reproduce, analysis, um, and then um, uh, analysis, then make, and then verify.mk that we had over there. So when you come to verify.mk, um, you come down here, look, we actually take all of the separate look over here in the plot um, uh, in, the, in the workflow, every make file finished with the tech file, right? Because the tech file then goes into the paper and makes the numbers and the plots. Um, so what we verify is the contents of each separate, um, um, of each separate uh, make file. So look like over here uh, for download.tech, we had the, the download. So for example, if you change the URL, because in the paper, we, we put the URL of the data in a footnote, right? So if you change the URL and keep the, and this is the checksum of the, um, of the download.tech uh, file. So if that changes, this is gonna change, the pipeline is gonna stop. Uh, and the same for format, the same for data plot. You see the checksums are recorded in the Git repository uh, for you to exactly verify that you get exactly what the authors intended. Then you're free. You can you can come here and you can. We actually have a configuration file, uh, analysis config. I'm writing down there at the bottom. Um, uh, verify outputs. You look like right now. Verify outputs is yes. You can just delete this. Like you can say no. Don't verify <laughs> because yeah. I want to. I want to start playing. I want to be curious. I want to. Uh, I don't want to be tied up. You know. Um, yeah. So it's it's easy to. Okay, so should I go on to the, let's go there to the fast hands question. Huh? Oh, there is, okay. okay. Yeah, thank you for a really nice talk. This is really cool. I'm interested in the way you're building or you're bootstrapping the software stacks. I mean, you, you showed a bunch of make files and you talk about building everything from the C compiler up. But if, if I have some exotic software or some unusual software, is it then the responsibility of the end user to effectively write the make files for every bit of software that you've not already pre-written make files for us? But that, that could be pretty labor intensive, right? Uh, yeah, it takes some time, but once, because, because it doesn't have a separate architecture, uh, that's my argument. So once you do your analysis, you, you become fully comfortable with make and dependencies, um, then adding a new software is really just like adding a new plot in your paper. You know, now there is uh, options, configure options. Uh, but yeah, the idea is that, for example, you add a new software for your project. Um, like, for example, you're doing cosmological simulations, for example, that I, I don't do, <laughs> right? I don't have, so I haven't added any analysis for cosmological simulation software. Um, then you do that, or you stay in touch with us. We help you do that. You do that in your project. Then once your project becomes public, we can just pick up that piece of code and bring it into the main branch for the next user. So then the next users will not have this problem. This is the, this is the idea that with the community, we can build um, all the software that people need. I, I'm, I'm curious as to what extent that has already got traction. You, you mentioned sort of in passing projects like Homebrew, but Homebrew has spent years coming exactly. up with recipes to build all the software you can think of. Yes. yes. Are you, are you anywhere like that scale or how much software do, we, do you actually have kind of packaged and ready yeah, to go? Yeah. So the thing is, because a reproducible solution will not be a graphic user environment solution, right? And one of the main problems I've seen, one of the main headaches in installing software is the graphic user interface ones, uh, because they have literally hundreds of dependencies. Um, for analysis software, you usually have much fewer uh, number. So yeah, ideally we depend on uh, you uh, if you're interested uh, to join us, um, we'll help you. We have a forum, we have a matrix chat room uh, that uh, you, know, you can just come and uh, um, uh, yeah, matrix is much better than Slack. <laughs> it's free software. Uh, everyone can, uh, can do. Uh, yeah, we have this managed forum here. People ask questions. We try to everyone, uh, you know, help out with each other to, uh, to simplify the job and bring everything into the managed branch. So everything that's general beyond the analysis of your, uh, of your high level science, um, we bring into the managed branch if you're interested to help us.
Okay, so let's go to the hands-on thing because we really don't have time and it's gonna take, so I'll show you the software. The software building is gonna be the first uh, step. So um, is it the font good or too large? Uh, is it readable for everyone? Good, uh, okay. So to start with manage, uh, let's clean up everything here. Um, uh, so RM19 and manage paper and then minus RF, we don't want this anymore. Okay, so uh, let's go to manage.org, which is the main web page for manage. And um, then over here, so we've already put the commands that you, you need to run. So um, we'll keep this on this side and um, we will now, um, so yeah, there's also the link to that same video I put in the in the in the Slack uh, is here. And uh, oh yeah, so since I mentioned those chat rooms uh, are here that we have in the Matrix protocol. That um, yeah, there you can even view them in Thunderbird and um, uh, even on the command line. You can actually use the, the Matrix chat on the command line. <laughs> it's really uh, and it has this nice interface as well. They're all here. So if you come to the manage web page, you can see the rooms that we have for um, uh, for uh, chats. Um, okay, so uh, then uh, let's keep this. Uh, so the first thing that uh, the first thing you should do is clone the core manage branch. So you come here and let's clone it. Okay, so we cloned manage. Uh, then the next step, let's go step by step based on this uh, the guide. So I'll make this smaller here, and uh, maybe I'll make this a little larger. Is it still good? Um, maybe too big uh, to show more. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, so then because by default, once you clone it, it gets a bit the directory named project comes. Well, then you want uh, MV project to my exciting discovery for example <laughs> all right and okay so now your project is called my exciting discovery and okay so let's go my exciting discovery and okay so the next step so this was the step that we just done then it's git remote rename so because by default the remote is now the main uh, manage uh, repository um uh but uh but yeah you want your separate remote you don't want to you can't push to the to the to the core manage branch. Uh, so let's change the name of the remote um, to uh, origin manage instead of origin. Um, and then finally, so the main branch is now called manage. This shows the branch. Uh, if I do git status, you can see we're on the on branch manage. Um, so now we check out to the main branch. So now I want to start my project. I go to main. Oh, I didn't copy the command. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I go to this and now I'm on the main branch. So if I do a git log, um, uh, like uh, one line graph, oh, you can see that right now my main branch is over the manage branch, um, uh, which because I haven't started uh, any commits or doing anything yet. Um, okay. So then we want to start configuring. So now uh, we do dot slash project and uh, configure, right? So just as it's recommended here. So we do configure, it actually tests and it uh, uh, now it wants your build directory. Where do you want to build your project? Because this is a really important point that you should never mix data, source code and build products in one directory. It's good to have them in different places. In my case, I, I have a whole separate uh, you know, uh, M2 disk, uh, not disk, uh, M2 storage <laughs> to, on my computer, which is only for data. Uh, so even, and because there's a lot of write and reads uh, and I can reproduce all my data, uh, yeah, that can break any time. If it breaks, I'm not going to get sad because, you know, I just have to spend another 50 euros buying another one. But, uh, but then I don't lose any data because my data is on another storage. Uh, my, my software, my, my source code that I spent years writing. Um, so then I come here, so it's in a separate mounted directory. Mount, I have a scratch directory, and then I have a build inside that scratch, and inside that build that's called this uh, Granada demo, for example. Okay, so we define this thing. Now it says, do you have your inputs? So look, it actually explains. Uh, everything. Um, uh, so ideally, if you spend time to read this, hopefully things will be clear. This is optional because as we as we showed, you already have the URLs. So if you have the data, you don't need to download. That's the advantage. It's faster. Um, uh, so in this case, let's say we don't have the data. So I didn't give a data directory. And again, for software tarballs. So software tarballs can be big. 
like the GCC tarball is, I think, 70 megabytes. <laughs> so uh, uh, it can slow down the build. So you, if you have the software tarball uh, in your computer, you can actually give the path here for like directory with all the tarballs. Um, so it doesn't download, but let's say to be a default user, we don't have the, uh, that either. Okay, so now it's gonna start building dependencies, look. And then it actually tells you that I'm gonna start building in here. So everything goes in this directory. And look, okay, so now it's the first thing it does is that it connects to the Zenodo repository I showed. And from the Zenodo repository, it starts getting the tarballs. There you go, it started, it downloaded the first one, which is the compression. That's the core, that's the lowest level software. Uh, like this compression thing isn't compressed because LZIP, you, you know, because we don't want the user to even have tar. You know, the user can even not have tar. Um, so we download LZIP essentially that is untar, so un uncompressed. And then from LZIP, so now it's actually building here. Look, it's going, it's doing everything. Uh, we can actually come in the CDTMP software and then we called it my exciting project. Um, there's actually a command project uh, check um, config. So, um, oh, I forgot the dashes. Um, here, look. So now it's building, busy installing gzip. So look, before this, it done lzip, it installed make. Just in this time that I was talking, uh, it uh, it installed make. Now it's busy with gzip. So gzip is a larger software. Um, uh, yeah, the compression software, are the first set of software we need um, uh, to build. Uh, then, okay, gzip finished. It went on to xzip. Look, and it even does the build in parallel. Look, because now it can, again, this is all make. Because uh, now that we have gzip, we're able to install bzip, xz, and zlib. Uh, so then we actually have all of these. Uh, you see, they all got installed pretty fast. They're all busy here. It's in that terminal. Um, so it's just crowded. I'm showing this other one. Um, so now it's installing xzip, um, xz. <laughs> and this will go. So this will, and you don't have to do this once. For a new computer, you can do it once, or you can use, you can build inside the container. That, that uh, the Manuel is going to show in the afternoon, and we actually have instructions. So if you go to the uh, the manage, um, uh, we actually have the the documentation is in the form of a, a readme file that actually comes with your project. So now I'm just showing it here in the browser because it's more uh, you know better formatted than uh, plain text Emacs. But we have a full set of instructions on how to build inside the container. So once you do the build inside the container. You just commit that container as an image, and then you can pull that image and go into another computer, and you don't have to spend time rebuilding everything from scratch. Um, so that is, for example, let me just show you because that's uh, I spent a lot of time on on writing that uh, in a nice way. Uh, I learned a lot about Docker <laughs> afterward. Uh, so look, tips for designing your project. There's many. Uh, oh, I went into the wrong file again. Um, so there's a readme.md, which is for the for the user, for the for the let's say for the person who wants to run your project, and then for you who want to write your project, there's a readme hacking because you're the hacker. You're hacking manage to your, you know, to your project. So you're the hacker. Uh, you should read readme hacking. But the users who want to run your project, they read readme. And then look in the README, there's actually empty places. You just put the name of your project here. You say like a reproducible source for, uh, I don't know, however you like to name your project. And then you add your copyright here. And then you describe, you see, everything is written. You just have to change these XXXs. You see, it's uh, it's everything is, it's, it's a basic template. You don't have to rewrite everything for a new user. Everything is already written. And uh, yeah, then for example, the part for the Docker, uh, explanation here. I've uh, everything is fully explained on how to make a Docker file um, uh, that will allow manage to easily um, uh, uh, build inside the Docker file that you can then avoid having to spend time um, rebuilding software. Um, so now let's see how it went. Okay, the compression file's finished. Now it's busy building libtool, XML, Perl because their dependencies of GCC. Can you believe it? Uh, the GCC has dependencies. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and a lot of dependencies. So now it's building, yeah, look, it, it done less, it built less, M4, you know, it's building this whole software stack and it's building them in parallel. So um, yeah, it takes, uh, usually on my computer with GCC, it takes about two hours um, to fully uh, do a science 
uh, even build the high level science software that we need. Um, so it goes, we have most of the Astro Pi packages that uh, people have needed, um, uh, GNU Astro and um, uh, many. So yeah, if you'd like to see the versions of the, the list of the existing software, uh, they're all here. But okay, so to get to the exciting part, I don't want to keep you for two hours just watching the list of software uh, getting built. So we're gonna stop this build. And I've already, uh, you know, uh, built, uh, managed before coming here this morning in a separate build directory on my computer. So I'm just going to do, uh, let's just check its location, uh, MNT, um, uh, so uh, scratch, build, um, uh, Granada demo one. Yes, so this is the, the 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 previous build directory that has all the software ready for you. So um, uh, we'll just go here. You see, this is the the top uh, build directory, and then I'm going to run project configure again, uh, but this time uh, configure, and this time I'm going to give um, this location instead of the previous build directory that has all the software installed. Um, okay, there's no input data, there's no uh, dependency tables. So just, um, so let it start, I'm gonna stop it. So because there's just a tiny, because I'm doing this strange thing that you know usually doesn't happen, we need to just manually, um, um, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch, uh, this. so we're just going to opt it because make depends on the timestamp of the files. So I'm going to touch, um, uh, there's a directory called build. Um, um, uh, and then inside build we have, um, uh, oh yeah, there's actually a dot local. And then over here we have version info, the tech, uh, the tech packages, um, they, they have their dependencies in the project. And because I uploaded my project later, um, so the build directory was done before I clone. Uh, they're gonna redo the tech, which I which we don't want to do. So I'll just manually touch these two files. So look when you do here. There's um, so now this is gonna fix uh, the dating problem. So and then we run configure minus e means the previous build directory. So now look, this is gonna again just check the auto and done. So the build directory is now ready. So now let me show you. In fact, um, we have. Um, uh, uh, within projects. So look on my computer, for example, LS version is LS from GNU Core Utils 9.3. Uh, now when I do project um, shell, you can actually go into the shell of manage because we even install bash, <laughs> you know. Uh, so you come here and now look, it says, welcome to the manage interactive shell. So you can actually test if you want to interactively test because in make, make is all in batch mode, right? It's all, um, you don't interact. But if you want to test things in the same version, you come here and I found this really convenient because like when I go to the large computers in, in our institute, they have old versions of software. The first thing I do is I install manage, then I just run project shell and I go into this beautiful updated uh, custom environment that I have for myself. Um, okay, so now if I do LS version here, look, it's different. It's good new core utils 9.1. Uh, this is not, if I do which LS, look, this LS actually comes from um, my manage project, uh, but if I come back into my terminal, uh, my own computer and I do which LS is, is user bin LS. It's a different LS. Um, uh, and within my make your whole uh, environment, uh, you know, is it doesn't come into your uh, manage environment. Okay, so how do we start customizing for a project? Let's see if I can catch this in the next uh, half an hour. Um, uh, okay, so. To start, now we want to start a new project. Uh, so we're going to work on the data that uh, Lourdes showed yesterday um, uh, for the uh, the HCG16, the gas uh, filament that was between the, the group of, uh, uh, that they done a really nice work on, uh, on making it reproducible. Um, so how do you start? So the way you start is that, again, you're the hacker, you're the, you're the person hacking manage. So you have to come to read me hacking. Um, and then we come, so then they, this is like an explanation for you. Uh, yeah, why make, so this is all here. I mean, if you don't want, I'm just showing it on the browser because it's, it's more fancy, but uh, it's all here as well. You can just do Emacs, read me hacking. You don't need internet connection. I want to say that you don't need internet connection. Um, and here you go, you have this exact 
file that I'm showing in the browser here, but it's, you know, it's just basic uh, text. So it doesn't do that nice formatting. So I'm going to show the formatting, the formatted version. Um, okay, so we have some a list of some published papers um, uh, that uh, then we describe the architecture. Okay, customization checklist. Over here, we show you how you can start uh, customizing or let's say hacking manage for your project. So this is the same steps we went before. And uh, then we ran project configure, we ran project make. Okay, so the first thing we do is that uh, we set up the remote. So uh, yesterday, Roberto was also saying that we have many repositories, not just GitHub, because did you know GitHub itself is not free software? <laughs> so look, it's promoting free software, but it's, it doesn't release its own code. It says, no, I want it, you know, because it belongs to Microsoft. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't want to release its own software, but then it's telling you release everything you want. So I don't like GitHub uh, because of this ethical reason. It's not, um, it's, uh, so I use, there's also GitLab, but GitLab also has proprietary uh, parts, which uh, again, I'm not comfortable with. So then there's a nice solution, codeberg.org. This is pure free software. Pure, you know, it's all free software. Um, um, and uh, yeah, since uh, I also develop free software, I'm a supporter of free software. <laughs> so let's work in uh, Codeberg, not, not GitLab or GitHub. Um, and so in Codeberg, uh, we just come here and we make a new repository. And okay, we'll call it uh, Granada demo, for example. And uh, no, we don't want it to be private. Uh, a demonstration, um, demonstration of manage. Uh, okay, um, we don't want any uh, readmes or anything. The main branch is branch. Make repository. No, create repository. Okay. So now we have um, the the you know the repository to add for our Git remote because we want to commit our changes. So we come here. We pick up this command. And uh, we put this command in the terminal. So essentially we add a new remote because remember we changed the remote name from origin. So now we have a new remote called origin and this remote is my repository here. So let's go to the, the checklist again. So this is, uh, this is what you can do. So then, yeah, let's go to the checklist and follow that exactly. So then it says, okay, git push, set upstream, origin main. So we just uh, copy this here and uh, Oh, I, uh, I I copied the uh, uh, the uh, did I close it? Oh no, it's okay. Um, so I should have copied the SSH version. Sorry. Uh, so let's take this and uh, git remote rm origin, and then we'll do this command again with the git version, so we don't have to give passwords every time. Okay, and then, so let's go get set uh, push, set upstream main. So now it asks for my password, for my SSH key, and there you go. So we finished. Now the, the, the basic managed branch is now in my repository. So when I refresh this page, um, I have here, you see the full contents of manage are now uh, here. And I'll also push the manage branch. So git push origin manage because we also had the manage branch right so this helps me uh in case my computer goes uh, uh i have i know which commit belongs to the manage branch so here you go you see on the repository now i have my main and my manage branch so far it's just blank so let's start uh let's start the exciting hacking part so now, when you configure the project, as we said, the main goal is to build paper.tdf, right? So when now we, we started the main, so let's do, let's do a project make. So now look, when I run project make, it actually downloads and inputs a basic data set because we haven't started changing anything. Look, it's actually downloading a data set from NASA, uh, an example from a definition of FITS file. <laughs> it's not anything complex. Uh, and then it just makes a few basic plots. And look, it's running later. It built a bibliography and here we go. If we do Evans uh, paper PDF, it's here. This is the paper that Manage built uh, from the core branch. So when you run Manage in the core branch, uh, you get this paper. Look, it actually says put the title here, 
put uh, put your name, put your co-author one, co-author two, and then so it says like you know the abstract is welcome to manage, you know, <laughs> and uh, and then yeah it actually explains. So then there's the basic instructions of how to uh, you know what this PDF is. Look, it actually made this tiny plot and it, it downloaded this basic FITS file and it shows like the histogram of this FITS file as a basic template that you can later use. Um, and this is the software acknowledgement part, look, that I, I was saying. So during the build that it takes yeah, almost uh, less than two hours, it even acknowledges the later packages that you use for, for the paper that was used for the paper and the names and the versions and the, the paper citations of all the software that needed citations. So you see, the project is now ready. So let's start, let's go, uh, we'll close the terminal. So the next step in the checklist is, okay, add your title. So let's go emacs minus nw and paper.tech. So I come here. So this is the plain, the, the source of the, the, the paper and the list of uh, authors are here. Okay, so I'm gonna put uh, my name. I'm like the first author of this exciting discovery. And then like Sepida is the second author. Um, and uh, yeah, for the third co-author, then we have, for example, Javier who suggested this nice data set and gave me the, the link. So we had the, uh, Javier moved on here. Okay, then the affiliations. Well, let me not put the affiliations. They're standard and basic. So like I'll just put Sefka and then oh, this one becomes one. Then Javier is two. And then over here, I, I add uh, IAA SSIC. Um, SCIC, right? Um, okay, and we don't need a third one. So then uh, now this is all later. So you can, if you, you this is a basic generic template, but if you have a special journal, you can just use the LaTeX source for that journal. Uh, this is just the LaTeX file, Man manage, um, just gives you some macros that you can use in it. And as you've seen in the published papers, we published the manage-based papers in MNRIS, in AANA, -A 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 in, uh, in AstroPH, uh, and, and sorry, APJ, um, and so on. So uh, yeah, this is just custom, as you all know, this is just for, this depends from journal to journal, um, but, but yeah, this is the default style because we don't want to take the time to update the journal. For example, I add my, my contact email here and okay, then I save it. And then I, um, I come back to the terminal and I run project make. It doesn't rebuild the software. It doesn't redo the analysis because Make already knows that they haven't changed. So it just builds the data. Okay, I made a mistake somewhere. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, in the oh yeah, I think I've the, the the curly braces at the end of the author list. I um, oh yeah, I closed this. I shouldn't have closed this. So in Emacs, uh, you can actually compile inside Emacs. It's easier. So project Make. Okay, and we can actually have a look at the PDF here. So we'll go to software, my exciting discovery and paper PDF. Here you go. You see my names are now here. And then um, uh, then you can start changing. Yeah, you can remove. So let's go, let's go based on the, the checklist. There's, uh, you, you're free. You're free to do anything you like with the later source. Um, 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 okay. Now, okay, so the title of your project is a little special. It's an important metadata, right? Because as I showed you in the example data set from the managed paper, um, we actually put this metadata in the data that you want to link to your paper. So there's a special file called, uh, if we go to reproduce um, analysis config metadata. And the title is actually here. So we want the same title to be used in your paper and to go into your fits uh, keywords and to go into your plain text uh, files that you want your users to read. So you just set it once here, it goes everywhere. Uh, so then we say uh, the exciting discovery we want uh, to write uh, in the SKA Open Science Work uh, School. Um, okay, then look over here, you can add all those other important things. The archive link, the Zenodo link, the journal, uh, all of these go here. You can put them, put them in the fit keywords of your outputs, in the plain text outputs, everywhere. Uh, also, the copyright of the data you produce. These are also important. Don't forget to add these. Um, so to avoid you forgetting, we have this here. 
So unless you change it, uh, and if you agree, then your data like is uh, Creative Commons uh, CC by SA. Um, so yeah, later when the, the the paper gets accepted in the journal, we, we, we get the archive and the journal DOIs, we put them here. Okay, so now if I rerun the project, um, you see the title changed and uh, and now we can, yeah, we can do this everywhere. So then what's the next steps? The next steps is to uh, delete the dummy parts. So, you know, this part, this, this, this basic plot is just a uh, y <laughs> equals x to the power of two. So this is just a dummy thing just to show you, uh, you know, that you can make plots. Um, uh, and for making plots, the, the, way, the way I like is, uh, is PGF plots in later, um, which, is, which is really good. You can use matplotlib. Um, people, you know, that use manage use matplotlib. We have matplotlib in the source, but don't forget the dependencies. <laughs> they are gonna kill you in the future. <laughs> so uh, the good thing, PGF plots is wonderful. Let me just advertise PGF because it's free software. So uh, PGF plots uh, later. If you don't know about it, I really recommend having a look at it. You'll enjoy it because you can actually plot with the same inside later, not inside, not outside it. You give the plain text the things and it has a wonderful manual. Um, it's, uh, it's huge, like it's 600 pages. It makes all kinds of plots in later. So it has the same fonts, the same structure, everything that, um, that uh, fits the line width. You know, they all fit with the structure of your paper and the, 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 typo, the typography of your paper. And um, so the internet is a little slow. It has a lot of figures, so you'll see in a second. Um, this is what I prefer to Matplotlib because yeah, the moment I learned about that dependency nightmare of Matplotlib, I stopped using it. <laughs> uh, but as I said, we, we, because many people use it, we spent the time to track all those dependencies and include them in manage. Um, but personally, I don't use it. Uh, so yeah, you see there's many, many nice examples with nice descriptions. Look, with just a simple later command, you can do a nice plot. You don't need, 200 dependencies. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, there's many, all kinds of plots are here. So anyway, this is uh, this is just one way to uh, to do plots. So all of these things you see here are built with uh, um, with uh, PGF plots. Okay, so we want to delete them. Now we, our plots are different. We don't want to use these plots here. So um, as the, let's go, uh, delete the dummy parts. So then we go, okay, in paper.tech, delete the text in the abstract. Look, it even tells you, okay, because yeah, the abstract is just a, a basic introduction. So we go to paper.tech and inside the abstract, we delete all of this and okay, we'll keep the, this PDF was made with manage. And then look, this is that macro I was saying. Um, this is actually the git commit. Look, if I go to the PDF at the end, look, because I haven't committed, it actually puts a nice dirty <laughs> thing. So let me show you. Look, this is the, and this actually encourages you to commit your work <laughs> because uh, if you haven't committed your work, it's going to put this ugly, dirty thing here. So this actually shows that you have changes that you haven't committed yet. Um, so, but you see in the, in the PDF, it's a number. But when I'm writing, I don't care. I just have the latex macro. Um, so then I come here and I say, uh, uh, in this demo paper, um, we will be looking at uh, the HCG16 data, for example. Okay, now we want to cite the, the um, my, Michael's paper. So let's go to ADS. Um, uh, Harvard.edu, and uh, then here we have, um, we, well, unfortunately, oh yeah, I've already activated JavaScript. It's really bad, ADS uh, now depends on JavaScript. Um, so um, um, the first author, Jones and Michael, um, and the year was 2019, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think we should be able to, Hopefully, if we find HCG, yes, it's here. Um, okay, the paper's here. We go to export citation. We pick up the citation from here. And again, Manage already has a place to put citations. So you just go to the tech directory, to the SRC, and then references.tech. So over here, we have the, the basic uh, depends. So in the paper, we actually want the, the this one, but in, you know, in the demo one, but here we don't. We don't want this one. Um, uh, let's we, let's keep this one because it, it actually includes some things with nice chisel. And um, okay, now over here I can paste 
uh, Michael's paper. Uh, and since we haven't yet included the, uh, the journal name Micros of ADS, we'll put the, this. Okay, so now we can actually come here and change this to uh, uh, Jones uh, uh, 19. Um, okay, now we it's ready. So manage is gonna, it, this is the dependency of Biblia, so to build the bibliography. And we come here and in paper.tech, uh, HCG data site T uh, Jones 19. Um, okay, but before running it, because we removed um, uh, two of the citations that are necessary, let's delete uh, those parts as well. So the main body of the textbook in the in the thing it says delete between start of main body and end of main body, right? So everything is uh, we we'll try to make it as as easy as possible in plain text. Um, so end of main body. So then you come to end of main body. And you, uh, okay, now we'll just write a section on um, introduction and to be written, for example. Um, and we'll put this end of main body here. Okay, so now we should be able to, um, uh, oh yeah, uh, also as so a look over here, it actually says, um, so the next step is to come to reproduce analysis make top dot make. So all of those make files are organized in this top.make. So we come into reproduce, analysis, make, uh, top make. And here we, uh, there's two, they actually, the name actually says delete me. Look, it's <laughs> it actually, it tells you to delete it. Uh, and then you go to verify, um, verify.mk. And then again, the delete me line, you just, uh, well, for now we will just disable, we'll just disable verify verification, um, configure uh, and verify outputs. We'll just set this to no, so we don't have to worry about verification. And, okay, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, so now we have the dependencies. We have the we have the basic paper. We stop the verification, and um, okay. So now we're ready. So if we run um, project uh, make again, it's building the bibliography. Michael Jones's paper is now here cited in the in the paper. Look, uh, you know, just like normal later. It's nothing magic. Uh, yeah, uh, it's here. And yeah, you actually have the citation. But the good thing is that Git status, look, we actually have all the changes we did. Um, and when we start committing this and we start going up in our own branch, the manage gets developed in its own branch, and then we can later um, do the thing. So I'm uh, I'm thinking if it's if there's enough time to uh, to make it. So let's just let's just go. Um, and uh, then uh, so we disable the verification. Then it says okay, delete all the delete me files. So again, the commands are all here. You just run rm delete me, uh, all the delete me's in the tech, uh, all the delete me's in the make, um, and all the delete me's in uh, the configurations. Okay, now there's actually a command called project make clean, right? So you just run project make clean and it deletes all the analysis. Um, so now we can uh, do project make and we now have a clean thing with no, with that, you know, previous fits file is no longer in the build directory. And uh, the PDF is now a basic uh, PDF that just has a short introduction and so on. You can start now going into your science and doing all the nice, uh, work that you do. Um, okay, so then uh, ignore changes in some manage files. So this is just when you're merging with manage. Uh, these are, the, if you add these, you're not going to have, you know, about those delete me things. Uh, they're not going to bother you. Oh, and then it's important. I'll, I should also mention it here. Copyright. Never forget copyright statements. Um, you know, like what Roberto was showing the other day. We should know how you like other people to use your data. So I've really put a lot of emphasis to highlight here that it's important to stay up to date with your copyright. Um, um, so uh, Luke it actually explains um, um, that all the files in manage have this uh, have the copyright statement. Then, for example, just to keep one of them, uh, let's go to emacspaper.tech. And uh, for example, look just up here. So for example, you come, okay, you start in 2023. Uh, and then, yeah, you just say like, uh, you know, you add your name. Oh, do you see the, the fonts? Um, 
your name and then you can put your email. Well, this is paper.tech. You shouldn't include me anymore. <laughs> um, and yeah, then you put your email. Um, so, uh, because you're going to be writing the main contents of paper.tech. In the analysis ones, you should keep the, the names of the previous people, but in the, uh, not, not a new analysis file. Like, for example, uh, you go to reproduce, analysis, make, top make. Um, this is the main make file that loads all those uh, sub make files. Um, and then over here, you shouldn't delete any existing names. You should come here. You should, uh, because you're starting, for example, in later when it goes to 2024, you can change the year. And then you say like, yeah, you add your name and um, your email dot com for example uh, so it's always important to do this uh, at the start every new file you make copy every every file you make like for your analysis copy this whole thing take it into the start of that file and add your name this is very important please take it seriously um, uh, later when you want to release because the main goal is reproducibility and reproducibility can't be done if people aren't allowed to run your code, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you should give them that, right? Um, okay, then over here is just basic git things that if someone forgets, and then your first commit. Um, uh, okay, so now let's do our first commit in our custom branch. So we, we come here, we make sure everything works, project make. Uh, yeah, the PDF is made. So now we do git status. Look, it, it has all the files that we edited or deleted. Git add minus u. The steps are all written here. Um, and then we do git status. Uh, and as in Git, we want to see the differences we did. So Git diff cached. Here we changed the look, we changed the copyright. We added a name here. We changed the author list. Uh, we deleted all this uh, dummy uh, text files, um, the parts that we didn't need. We added the bibliography of Michael's paper. Okay, now we want to commit Git commit. Um, uh, so um, start of project, right? And then you have a start of project uh, for implemented, um, like uh, implemented checklist. Uh, yeah, then you say you can write as much as you like, like, you know, all the things you changed. So you save all of these, you come out, and when you do uh, one line again, now you're one commit in front of the manage commit, you know, and then you can nicely uh, do, it, do it as much as you like of your analysis. The make file, so I wanted to add an example. I didn't get to actually use the make file. So I have five minutes before Sepide, so we'll put 15 minutes for Sepide uh, to show what how she's used manage in her project. I'll just input uh, the, the data uh, from, from Michael's paper. So um, as I said, so let's go. Uh, Emacs, um, and then uh, uh, reproduce, analysis, config, and inputs. So this is, um, I'll just put it in the terminal, uh, NW, okay. So over here, look, everything is fully commented. You see everything, this is all comments. This is not code. It describes everything. Look at the, the, then how the logic behind all of these things. So then over here, we want, for example, uh, Michael's uh, data set. So I have the link to, to Michael's, uh, the, the CDS uh, um, uh, link is, in this other repository. Come on, not much time. Let's take this here uh, and we'll, uh, so uh, this is, oh, this is the terminal. I have to paste like this. Okay, so this is the URL of, um, of, the, of the data from um, um, the HCG paper. And then the file size, this is just an optional thing for human readers, you know? So they know if they, if they run your pipeline, they're gonna need like, you know, two terabytes of space. So they know that beforehand. So in this case, I think it's about 40 megabytes. Now later we can change it. Okay, now the hash. So let's, oh, by the way, let's call this hcg16.fits. Um, so the file that's going to get downloaded is hcg16.fits. All of these should be hcg16.fits. Um, so we don't know the checksum yet. So we'll just put some junk code here. It's going to crash, and then it's going to give us the, the checksum automatically. Um, okay, so now in the analysis, we want this hcg, right? So what we do, we come into the analysis top uh, make, oh, sorry, make, and then top uh, make. And inside top make, we add a new file called uh, um, 
before the verify because verify happens after uh, HCG uh, 16 dot, well, HCG 16, we just call it uh, that. Um, uh, this automatically adds the MK or tech files where necessary. Um, uh, so now we make a new file hcg uh, hcg 16.mk uh, so inside this new file remember every make file needed a, a data file at the bottom so to follow our own advice when we make a new file the first thing we should do is the are uh, you remember the copyright don't jump into your analysis first put the copyright um, so you you put the copyright so now that we have the copyright, then remember every make file needed a tech file. So uh, we can take one from the uh, from initialize.mk, which is always there. Um, so we define the target over here. But the only thing is that this has to be, these are all explained in the readme file as you, as you read along. So hcg16, it has to be the same name as the make file. Um, okay, and then we say this depends on, um, uh, let's say hcg16. Uh, and then we just say touch dollar at in make it means the target um so now we just say hcg 16 is um the build analysis directory um hcg 16 well we can actually just we don't even need that we'll just put in dir um hcg slash hcg 16 that fits Okay, now if we run the project, MX uh, will go to the top project directory and run it, compile, um, and project make. So look, now it's downloading. It's downloading the data from CDS, from the URL. And okay, look, it crashed. Uh, let's make this full screen. It says, aha, look, I caught your hand, you know, you're, you're caught red-handed, for example. The checksums are, done, are not match, you know. So now we know, but then look, it says the expected checksum. You know, we just put a crazy set of characters because we didn't know. Uh, now we know the checksum from here. So we just pick this up and um, we copy this and we go back to inputs.conf and we put the checksum here. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, we put the checksum here. Now, if we recompile, uh, here you go, we got the paper. And uh, yeah, then uh, now we can add analysis steps with make uh, and go on. So there's the video on make. Uh, I recommend you to watch that. You'll understand how to, how the, you know, how to optimize make a lot for your analysis. So I'll stop here. So Sefi, they can show how uh, she's done her PhD thesis and her experience as a PhD student uh, uh, on, um, on yeah, doing her whole thesis with Manage. So Sefi, please, uh, I'll stop sharing and you can continue.